Um, so we are extraordinarily lucky uh, today um, to have Daniel Ramos with us here, um, an internationally exhibited artist and photographer currently living in the great city of Jamaica, Connecticut. Um, his work looks to his family and community, exploring their journeys, how they were changed by them, the memories of past experience, um, and the enduring presence of those experiences. Um, in 2019, he produced an artist book entitled The Land of Illustrious Men, a uh, story of immigration, labor, growing up in Chicago and the way we um, choosing to break from a path of food quality work um, and turn toward art of being a son uh, and becoming a father of the work uh, in a large scale exhibition um, that is really, um, I don't know if you'll see a slide, but if you go to his website, which is on the uh, class page, um, you can see some images from the exhibition. It's really interesting, uh, especially for those who saw the um, BFA work downstairs, they think about sort of more ways to show um, photographic work. Um, really interesting thing. Um, uh, shown at Art Space in San Antonio, as well as Filter Space in Chicago. Uh, he's taught documentary photography in Monterey, Mexico. Um, and feature featured the New York Times Lens Column, was awarded a 2018 Arts Residency at the Center of Photography in Woodstock, uh, a residency at Lightwork, profiles of Ian's EDU blog. Um, I mean, this is, this is a lot. You're not helping me out with all these here. And he is currently a 2021 2022 fellow. Um, at how do you pronounce it? Next Haven? Next Haven. Next Haven um, in Connecticut. So please join me in welcoming Daniel Ramos. Thank you, Brad, for the lovely introduction. Um, thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure and an honor. I would like to start with a series of photographs that I did while I was a student at Columbia College in Chicago. And the images that I'll be showing are portraits of factory workers where my father and I worked. My father actually worked there for 40 plus years. And the company's name is Sloan Valve. And my, our job was to polish flushing valves. So every time I go to urinate, I see these uh, flushing, plumbing, um, you know, valves. And I decided to, um, put my practice of learning how to use a view camera and studio lighting while I was working. Now, I have to say that I had no prior knowledge of photography when I started to study photography. I was very naive. I did not know what a darkroom was or even how sensitive film was to light. And I took it upon myself to, to really go the extra mile and I, once I learned about the difference between the 35 millimeter camera and the view camera, I decided to focus my, my attention to learn how to photograph with a large format. And I decided to put that um, in, in learning how to do it in the factory where I work. So I proposed to the factory that I wanted to make portraits of my coworkers. And there was only one rule that I could only photograph them during our mutual breaks. So that meant that I had to convince my coworkers to have their picture taken, but also I only had between 15 minutes to do a photograph. And also imagine, you know, you're, you're just, these are back-breaking jobs and no one wants to sacrifice their, their break for a picture. And believe it or not, even though I was an insider in this factory, working with them next you know day to day it didn't facilitate me having more access to photographing and more or make or getting the okay to making a picture it took me six months to actually make my first portrait um so in the meantime i will browse the factory and look for location so when i in my mind i said once I get that one person that agreed to a photograph, I know where I would like to take the picture. So I will, will scout locations inside the factory. And this picture that you see is of Eugene. And this is the first photograph I actually made in the factory. And later on in the slide presentation, you're gonna see a very similar photograph like this, but it's me. 
the deal was that Eugene, in order for him to agree for a photograph, he had to photograph me first, doing exactly what I wanted him to do. Um, and miraculously, once I made this picture and I brought a print to the man, then everyone in the factory wanted a photograph. Then it was my chance to then be the person that decided who I would like to photograph. Believe it or not, I think that not everyone is photographable, and that's a choice that you have, a personal aesthetic that you make. And also, I also believe a lot in, um, in when it comes to portraiture, that the people you choose to photograph too have to work with you in the way where they feel your vibe and you feel their vibe, and then this image is made. And there's this sentiment of this, to me, um, this quietness that happens. Now this leads to the part of my um, actually breakthrough. You know, ironically, most artists wait to the end of their life to speak about their life, uh, something autobiographical. And as you will notice, my work is very autobiographical. I work from things that I really know really well, such as my family, friends, neighborhood, as you can tell from the factory where I was, or the factory that I worked at. Um, in 2014, my wife and I decided to move to Mexico. And we, we did this really without a plan. And I, as I was out in Mexico, we were living in Monterrey. And Monterrey, Mexico is about two hours and a half from the Texan border. So I thought about making a project in, in, along the border. And I, you know, as I started trying to do this work, I started reflecting upon my life. Like, why, why am I interested in photographing people that are trying to cross into this country when my father and my mother had done that action? So I started reflecting even deeper. I started going into my personal archive and uh, also family memorabilia, things that they left behind and their oral stories. So what you're looking at right now is the cover of the book. The Land of Illustrious Men. And I got the title from um, a story that I remember uh, for my grandmother. Uh, she is from this town in, in the state of Nuevo León. It's a uh, northern town, it's like where Monterrey is. And the town slogan is The Land of Illustrious Men. So it's, it's this dusty town, right? Um, really much not going on. So I used to tease her and I will ask her, where, where are the illustrious men in this dusty town? And one day she replied that she was hoping that I would be one of them. And that stuck with me. This happened when I was like about eight or nine years old. And when I thought about this project, I didn't, I didn't think of it at the time for exhibition. I actually was thinking of making a book. Turns out that my wife is a graphic designer and she also knows how to make books with her hands. This is all handmade books. It was a series of 50 books. And I, I really thought of it you know, in my brain, I, I, I wanted to make a book that was only just pictures, and then the second book was going to be more of an experimentation for me. And I say that because I went to a school that's a very traditional um, school with photography. You know, this is Chicago, and if you know the history, there's the whole uh, background with the uh, Institute of Design, Harry Callahan, and all oh, this program. There's this program that was made in Chicago. Um, a lot of my teachers were in this program. So they taught me photography in a I mean, formal word where you could not mix color images with black and white images. Everything was supposed to be, you know, you know the composition had to be down, you know, like they could tell any mistake. So there really wasn't uh, much freedom for you to experiment with the image. So when I decided to make the second part to this book, I decided to do something more for me, something not where I was out to satisfy my teachers or my professors. It was more, who am I? So I went through work that I did from 1999 to the present. And I was photographing, I mean, not photographing, I, I was looking at images from Chicago, where I'm usually, where I'm from, I'm sorry. And the book is, is about my experience living between Chicago and Mexico. And I had this, this, um, 
this experience because my parents will send me out to uh, Mexico every summer so I could avoid the violence in Chicago. That was their way of them trying to take care of me. So I want to be clear that for me, like I always knew who I was. I, I never had this identity uh, issue or, or, or question. I knew that, that I, I am from Chicago and ironically, being in Mexico and speaking Spanish fluently and living in Mexico, um, as they were as they were realized that I that I was born in Chicago, they did not consider me Mexican. They were like, "Oh, you're you're this Chicano pocho individual." But then in the United States, as they heard me speak English, they will also tell me, "Oh, your English is really good for for being where you're from." And I thought that was hilarious because I am from Chicago. I went to school in. in in the States. So my reply was always, your English is really good too. And so for me, it was always more about like where, what I've always wanted was to feel welcome. But it turns out that that was an issue for both Mexico and the United States. And I learned that, that I, I shouldn't really care what other people think about where I should be from. I know where I'm from and, and what has made me. So this book taught me this lesson as I was making it. And you will see images that have that, um, you could notice the place, the difference. So I, I, um, I looked through all my archives, and right now you're looking at a photograph of my grandfather, uh, Pedro, who, li who lived in Guanajuato. And those were my excursions as a kid that I remembered and I wanted. Re I, so what you're looking at is all a recreation of what I lived once. You know, if you're familiar with the view camera, there's a, it's a big camera, you got to put it on a tripod. So I cannot be very spontaneous when I make these pictures. So everything you're looking at is, is, is directed. Even how I tell him to look at me, what to do with his hands, where to sit. I'm big in scouting areas. That's something I love doing in, um, with photography. Like I, I, depending on where I'm photographing, I really make sure that I explore the place, I take notes, and then I'm like, oh, I would like this person here, or I would like to do this. Because that's the power of, of working with a view camera. You can take your time. Once they decide that they're willing to take the picture, it's, it's your world. And I'm also interested in, in the spaces. Um, I think that it's a place or a person's uh, home or whatever, where they, where they hang out or where they spend their time, could also tell you something, you know, psychological. This is a self-portrait of me in my grandfather's uh, bathroom. This is an image of uh, a bus station in Laredo, Texas. Sometimes, um, you know, if, if, we, if I could, my family couldn't afford to send me by plane to Mexico, there were these buses that will actually travel from Chicago to Monterrey. And they will do this all in one uh, night. And there was a stop. Before you got into the border, they made sure they changed buses. And the last stop is Laredo. That's the, the, that's the last city in the United States before you enter Mexico. Obviously, this is now me making an image from that bus, but in Mexico. And you can tell the difference between formats. This is a 35 millimeter. It's now this is where I could be more spontaneous. This is the city of Monterrey in the year 2000. If this now this city is even this area is now full of skyscrapers. Now this is an image of the town where my grandmother's from, and this is where I started thinking about recreating what my childhood like, what my childhood was like in Mexico. And these are the son of my friends that when I was a kid in Mexico. This picture, you know, uh, taught me another lesson. I wanted to make an image of Philo, that's, that's his name, with my son. They would play at this uh, playground in, in this uh, oasis. There's an oasis in, in the town of Lampasas. 
And I was really stubborn. I really wanted this picture of them by the swing. And as I was preparing the camera, setting it up, and framing it, my son and Pila were playing in the leaves, hide, hide and seek. So they would cover themselves with leaves, and, um, and then like dig, dig each other out. And I, and I got kind of angry because they were not participating with me in the image that I wanted to make. But then I looked at the actual thing that was happening, and that was more interesting than what I imagined, or, that I, or the image that I wanted to make. So the lesson that it taught me is that whatever I could imagine, sometimes reality is a lot more interesting than what I think I could make. And it made me to be more attentive to what actually is happening behind me or what's happening as I'm trying to make a picture. And now here's another photograph. This is my mother and my, my mother, and I made this picture in the year 2002. And this is me learning color photography. And again, here I, I, I wanted to create the moment that I felt when I would come back from school. What, what is it that my parents were doing um, every time I came back? And I, you know, now my mother's no longer here, but this is something that, that to me, I, I think about a lot, and, and especially with photography. That I'm able to, in my mind, my mother is still here every time I look at this picture. And of course, once that picture is gone or I'm not looking at it anymore, I, I realize that she's no longer with us. And that's what I, what I talk about with, with the power of a photo, of, of, of a great photograph. And it reminds me of the time when, of, of that particular moment. And I think that a lot of us could be very, uh, could relate a lot to this. And I know that you know, throughout my, my, um, my career, something that I know that I've always thought about is that I just did not want to speak about my experience as a Mexican-American, but a universal one, where you're able to see your parents. Obviously, it's mine, and people do ask me, how do I feel about working with, with, with work that is very personal? And, and my answer is that I don't think about that. I actually think that what makes us the same is that we, we react to these things. We, we have a, a positive... Um, idea or, or a pleasant memory. And that's, that's something that I thrive for. This is an image of my uncle, my uncle visiting Mexico. He, he did not get to visit his town as, as often as, as he would like. But then again, like this is a play of the environment. He, he actually wasn't here, you know, sitting in that, you know, by a well. I, I decided to make that image. So, I believe that environment and then how you direct the portrait to make a powerful thing, both of them when you use them in a creative way. Here is my father, my mother, my uncle, and they're, my uncle's leaning on a van that you will also see uh, eventually in the slide presentation. And this is uh, us on the road to Monterrey. This is my grandmother and her home in the town of Lampazo. And this image was made in 2002. And then this image of my grandmother was made in 2018. So I've been photographing my family since I started start studying photography. And I never stopped. And I plan to continue to do it, but now I'm photographing my family, my mother, my son, myself, and our experience with, um, with art. How, how is it that I'm, you know, coming from this background, I'm able to do this practice? And what does that look like? And I, I have to say, you know, when people invite me to talk about my work, I really, I, I accept because I know what it's like when you don't know anything about what you're studying. You know, or not only do not know, but for example, my parents didn't know anything about art. So 
So they weren't able, they were not able to, to uh, guide me even, you know, I know they wanted to, I mean, that's, that's the love of parents, but when you don't have that, you got to, you know, you got to figure these things out on your own. So when they invite me to do this, I would like to share as much as I can to, 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 to tell you how this is possible. And as you can see, I, I stuck to, to a subject throughout my life. I never actually stopped. This is the cemetery where both my grandmother and my mother are buried in Lampata. This is me and my wife in Coyacan, in La Casa Sur, where Frida and Diego live. And believe it or not, I mean, even though my, my work would be sad and, and there's this, this melancholia, I do have a, a sense of humor. And I thought it would be funny to place my wife and I and think of ourselves as Diego and Frida. This is my wife and my son in Monterrey. And I, uh, this, is, this is my favorite photograph that I've ever made. I, I, I really feel blessed or, or very fortunate to have someone to look at me this way. And for me, and not only as an artist to be able to see it, but then to record it and then also to make it into, into art. This is my son. So what you were looking at were all images that were in book one of the land of illustrious men. And this is the part that I was talking about where I decided to make a second book. And I decided to I, I, I was being a wise man here. You know, I don't want to curse, but I, I decided to make a book just in case you wanted to know, just in case that you didn't understand what book one was about. I made a book with text and images. And um, this book, I, I got granted the Dorothy Lang Paul Taylor Prize. I, I couldn't believe that I, that I got such a prize considering, you know, when you're learning photography, Dorothy Lang and, and that, that book of, of with Paul Taylor is, is now part of my legacy. That a story that to me was, you know, I only thought that I would care about it, but I, I believed in the work. And, that, that act of actually writing on the negative or writing on a silver gelatin print when they taught you that you should never do that, you should spot your images, they should be clean. And then for me to do something completely opposite of what they taught me and then to learn that the way that it was being received out in the world was, was with a lot of positivity really shook my world because I was like, wow, like, School taught me, you know, all these rules and that I still respect, but it also um, led me to figure out who I was as an artist. And in these, these images and these texts, I, I describe a lot of the stories that were passed down to me orally by, by my father, by my mother, grandmother. I, I put drawings that I did as a kid stories, um, and this one is, is a very personal one, where, um, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't experience my first summer in Chicago until I was 18 years old. I didn't know what summers were like in Chicago. Did not know that. And the first summer that I spent there, my best friend who lived on the third floor, and I lived on the first floor, got assassinated, at the, you know, on his birthday when he turned 21. And I, and I couldn't believe that, that, that this happened. And it's something that I still am dealing with, you know, it's a trauma when, when, you're, when you're this young and you get to, to experience death. And especially of someone that you thought you were going to be with like, to old age, right? And um, I guess that's the bittersweetness that I have with this country. Why is it, why, 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 why are these things happening? Here's a story of my, you know, of me as a child when I wanted, I wanted this Nintendo, right? I, I, uh, I wanted really bad, but I was 11 years old, and, and you know, my father said if I wanted a Nintendo, that I should get it with my own money, and I said, well, get me a job. And my father had two jobs. He worked at this factory at Sloan, and he worked at a tortilla factory. So he got me a job at a tortilla factory when I was 11 years old. 
I worked a Saturday and Sunday. So on my payday, I made about a hundred bucks. So he, he decided to take me to Toys R Us. And he's like, let's go buy your Nintendo. So we go. And once I'm about to pay, I decide that I don't want that Nintendo anymore. And then, then my father's like, well, what's up? Why don't, why don't you want to buy it? I said, I don't think it's worth my money. <laughs> <laughs> this was backbreaking work, so I, I think I'm just going to skip on it and, and figure something out, you know, how to entertain myself. But it taught me a lesson, I mean, at, at that age. And I think about this a lot because it was the same with, with the way I was thinking about photography, how I wanted to master, you know, um, the grayscale, making images in black and white. And I was just like a stubborn person, like, I got to finish what I started and be very discipline in, in, in how I make pictures and how I want to print them. And here's another story of my mother and then looking through my photographs when I was a student you know, at Columbia College. Stories about how uh, their first business and, and the first dollars they made. And now, here is something that actually started really pushing my work in another place. Um, I, I, in, in the year 2020, um, January 2020, I started a residency in San Antonio, Texas. The residency is under Art Pace. And I don't know if you're familiar with this residency, um, and I'll, I'll explain a, a little bit about it. So the, the, uh, Linda Pace created this, this residency program in San Antonio, and she will choose a curator. And the curator then will choose an international artist and a national artist of their choice. But Linda Pace wanted one, San, one, one artist to be from Texas. So there's a call, and, and tons of applications come in, and then the curator will look through these uh, applications and choose an artist from Texas. I was chosen out of 800 people to participate. And they do this uh, exhibition three times a year during uh, summer, spring, and, and, and fall. So when, when I got the news that I got this uh, residency, it was a really, really big deal because um, not many photographers get it, especially when you look at the photographs that I make that, that get categorized as documentary. Um, it's, it's very odd. But I proposed that I wanted to make an exhibition about the book. I wanted to make that book into a 3D experience. And when I mentioned the van, that van that was in the photograph of my mother and my uncle and, and father, that's that van. So I decided to bring this van into the exhibition. And the idea was to create, um, uh, uh, I wanted to create this experience of a road trip. So this is prior COVID, right? This is, I was there from January to March. The day that the exhibition was so, supposed to open is when the country went into lockdown. But this van, you were able to go inside and get to see the whole uh, exhibition. And I wanted to show you the process of how I came upon. So this is the studio space they give us to work in, but it's also gonna be the final exhibition space. So as you were making the work, you will hang it. And you will, you will basically also be the curator of your own show. And I, I like working, you know, this is what I meant about how, how important this, this, um, this residency was for me is because I started thinking not, not just about the, the conventional way of framing pictures. You know, I wanted to use furniture, and I, and I brought furniture from Mexico, and then I dissected furniture, um, and I, I, I put a van, and I put images in the van. So I, I, I really started to push myself in how can I um, express myself, not just with the, with the picture in a frame. So this wardrobe, you know, um, they're passed down in family. So this was my mother's, my grandmother's, and my mother's, and then mine. So I, I broke it down. 
I decided to break it and make this piece with the mattress and keys hanging from it and spoons in the bottom. And I decided to put the mattress on top because I, 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 it was a homage to my, to my mother and my, my grandmother, resting in peace. And all these keys were, were inside this Crown Royal bag, inside this uh, wardrobe. And the reason why my grandmother had all these keys was because every summer that we went to Mexico and came back to Chicago, she would change the locks. She thought that by changing the locks, no one could break in, but she kept these keys. And I, and I decided to hang each one. And she also had these spoons that she thought they were actual silver. So I went the extra mile and I spray painted them gold. And that's an image of her on the corner. And this is how I will hang all the keys that she collected through her lifetime. And now here is the vitrine that also is passed down, and they're, they're very typical in, in Latin American families. Um, you know, you fill them up with tchotchkes. You know, it's the thing that you're most proud of, pictures of your, of your kids from you know, graduating, etc. But I decided to put the collages that I created in my book, too, into this vitrine. So I really am interested in how history is, 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 is very important in how you behave in the future. I, I could only trace my history up to my grandmother. But when you look at families or royalty, they're able to trace their history more than six, seven, eight generations. And I, I am actually jealous of that because I'm, I, I would like to know who my great-grandmother was or great-great-great-grandfather was, et cetera, et cetera. I think that when you're able to trace your history, you, you, you start valuing yourself. And that value that you give yourself then leads you to have a bright future where you avoid nonsense or you don't behave a certain way because you have a history. So I wanted to start now with, with as much as I could remember. And I was thinking a lot about my child, where his parents come from, or his great, or his grandfather come from, and his great grandmother comes from. What are the sacrifices they did to come to this country? And then on the other side of the exhibition, I decided to do my experience living in the United States. So as you can see, you got doors with awnings, and the doors are from Mexico, and the awnings are, are from Chicago. Uh, they're, they're a very typical thing in the architecture in, in working class neighborhoods. And as you approach the, the doors, a light will go on. And I decided to put memorabilia that I had as a child, and also families. And I, and I nailed it to the door. And as I was nailing the door, all these, you know, wooden crumbs will, will fall, and I decided then to put those on top. I really wanted to create this raw experience of uh, what's it like, or what it felt like for me growing up in, in the city of Chicago. And this three-piece collage, the first, the first panel is my, my father's story, how he migrated into this country. And then my story is the middle panel, me growing up in Chicago. And the third one is my son's. And what you're looking at is a bunch of images that I've made and I decided to cut and, and collage and I printed in various papers. Living in Mexico, I, I learned a lot through making the book, which that's where the book was made. And um, I don't know how many of you have visited Mexico, but it's a, it's a very rich place with resources when it comes to materials. And when it comes to paper, you get this amazing uh, texture or, or weight of paper. And um, when it prints, you get really beautiful results, very unique ones. I, I even, um, in Mexico, they sell you tortillas by the kilo and they wrap it up on this piece of paper that's kind of like a newsprint, but it's not. It has more of a satin uh, texture. And that paper is something that, that I love to print out. 
and especially when you were printing in black and white. So I, I was playing with that a lot for this collage. And these are all details of the collage piece. And now last, this is my most recent project. Um, as I was living in Monterrey, I would hang out in these very dark and dingy, sweaty bars. I, I am a big fan of music. I started collecting music as a child. Uh, I started with uh, rap, hip hop, and that led me to jazz, and then jazz led me to music from around the world. And these clubs will play this cumbia music, but they play this cumbia music where it's slow pitched where you slow down the record. So it's like this blah, sound. And I, I like that. And I will hang out at these bars. And eventually they could tell that I was very different from them because of the class. So this is a very working class environment bar. Right? So I decided to make pictures in this place with my view camera. And I decided to do that because I've already had experience, again, venturing out with collages, installation, but I wanted to come back to my roots and to what I knew how to do really well, uh, or that I had this knack. Um, so I decided to, to go back to the view camera. So when I spoke to the owner of the bar that I wanted to make pictures here, she, she, she gave me the okay, but I could tell that she thought that I was going to come in with a camera, like a 35 millimeter or digital, and, and charge people for the picture, like, oh, here I'm a you know, street photographer and I take pictures. So when she saw me come in with the view camera and a strobe, she, and a tripod, she was like, oh, this is a serious thing, you know? Um, I'm like, yeah, but there's, there's, I mean, is there a problem? Or, or she's like, no, no, I'm just afraid, you know, people might want to take it or something. I'm like, I doubt it because it's, who were like, who, I don't think this thing would sell. Um, so it was okay, but again, I went through the same process as I did with the factory series when no one wanted their picture taken, and then someone finally agreed, and I, I bring a print, and then everyone wanted it. Um, but here, it was a lot more intense because, you know, the space, these, I'm working in this one bar only. So my challenge was to make different pictures between these four walls. So I will come in again and like, I mean, there's not much that I could actually look at or like scout, right? So I started creating a studio space inside these bars. And I learned that most of the people that I photograph have never had the opportunity to, to, to have a picture taken. They didn't, they know, it, it's, it was not in their world for them to go one day and say, I'm going to go to the studio and make a picture of myself. So it was a very um, like profound experience for me because they've never had seen themselves on a piece of paper printed. You know, like they, they, they actually will tell me, is this how I really look? I'm like, this is you. And this is as much as I think I mean, this is that I could do, but I know what they meant. They meant that this is how the world sees me. And I, I, um, I also learned that, that, that when I, I think I said it earlier, but it also taught me that the way that they will look at me is how they, will, they were perceiving me, right? And I, I felt this, this, this uh, very uh, fortunate thing, you know, where, where, where they, they, were, they were seeing me as an equal, even though I came from a different social class. And eventually, as I started talking to them, they figured out that I was from the States. And 
another story is that they, you know, they were, there was a time where they wanted to come to the United States, but then eventually they got tired of trying. That they said that the only way they were now going to be in this country was through these pictures. That they were going to be able to be seen by people that was foreign to them. And I titled this project, It Is Muy Hermosa, You Are Beautiful. And all this is done with one light. I don't use that much lighting, even for the factory. I, um, I like creating that drama with one single light. But as you could tell, I'm very graphic. So then after I started photographing people, I said, I want to describe what Mexico looks like at night. And all, all this, this body of work was done at night. I, I, I put it upon myself to photograph at the hours where, where most people don't come out at night. You know, Mexico is a very notorious place for its violence. Um, but I decided to go out there and make these pictures. That's it. Thank you.